Hi, and welcome to episode number 149 of the weekly Google Cloud Platform podcast. I'm Mark Vandal, and I'm here with my colleague, almost always, uh, Melanie Warwick. How are you doing, Melanie? Hi, Mark. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing all right. Yes, we are back from Strange Loop this week. At least for a minute, we're together yep. in San Francisco, which is good. Lovely. And this week, we're going to be sharing another episode from some of the episodes I gathered while I was in South Africa a couple weeks back. And Thank you. Specifically for episode 149, we have with us this week Yabibel and Jessica, who are both researchers from the Ames Research Group based in South Africa. Awesome. So, looking forward to hearing from them and talking to them about some of the research they're doing and other organizations that are in the area. But before we get into that, we will always do like we do the cool things of the week, and we will end with a question of the week. And so for this week, our question, as always, coming from Mark, yeah. uh, if I'm using the cluster autoscaler for Kubernetes or GKE, how can I prevent it from removing specific nodes from the cluster when scaling down? I have an answer. I'm glad you have an answer. I do. You always you have all the answers. Not all the answers. Some of the answers. I have some of the Kubernetes answers. Or you make it sound like you have no. <laughs> it's good. It's all good. All right. Well, Mark, let's talk about cool things of the week. And we've got one at the top that's that's of course down it's your expertise. It is, it's alley. true. Actually I really like this blog post on the Google Cloud blog called a Kubernetes fact for the C suite. So basically for CX, OTARP level, or I think even people who aren't necessarily technically oriented, maybe like not engineers, that kind of stuff, but want to understand what Kubernetes is and what benefits it gives. It has a really nice breakdown of like, what is Kubernetes? Why does Kubernetes matter? Why does IT like Kubernetes so much? What are the main benefits, et cetera, et cetera? How do I get started? That kind of stuff. And it has some technical as well as non-technical answers, as well as different perspectives that may help you explain it to people who, who sit maybe at a C-level or like a business level or that kind of stuff. I actually really do like it. Do we have any C-suites out they're listening to us? I hope so. No, that's not, not our target. But uh, <laughs> but yes, we probably have a mixture of people out there. Anyway, so let me go ahead and talk about a blog post about BigQuery and surrogate keys. So this is a how to set up a surrogate key in your BigQuery. And this is a nice practical approach that Marco Tranquilin had put together. And he talks about you know how you can generate it. You could do something where you're like hashing the row number. There's some alternative approaches he has around like actually a hash of the record fields and using the result as a surrogate key. So he gives you a step through on how you can do that, and we'll include that link in the show notes. Nice. Coming up next, uh, there's also a great article from the serverless compute team talking about adding customer intelligence to Gmail with serverless on GCP. Basically, it's a really nice how-to on how to build your own intelligence into your own Gmail uh, capabilities. So if you've ever wanted to do your own custom actions based on, say, a particular email coming in or a set of email or content inside an email or basically anything, really, it gives you basically pretty much all the code that you need to do to do that and set that up for yourself. So if you ever wanted to automate yourself out of a job or maybe into a job, this might be for you. I know. You want to take it to the next level. I actually did try automating something way back in the day with my Gmail, so it's nice to see that there's some more established tools that you can use versus trying to write it from scratch. I should try that. I should check it out. All right. Well, the other thing we wanted to mention is they are announcing Google Cloud Tasks. It's a task QU service for App Engine Flex and second generation runtime. So this is basically a centralized cloud task API that's fully managed, asynchronous, allows you to, in essence, do task execution service for any application running anywhere using a standard API. So it's great for task queue use. And they talk through that a little bit and help you understand what that means, what that looks like for App Engine, especially considering if you were using task queue use in the past. Uh, apparently, this is really all the stuff you would do with task queue you, you will do with cloud tasks. So you can check that out. Yeah. Worth noting, like existing App Engine customers can continue to manage their tasks via the App Engine SDK. It's all still going to work. That's good. All right. I think we wanted to give one last mention, which is sort of related to something we, we touched on back when we talked to Jeff Dean a couple weeks back ago. Yep. Yeah, so Unity and DeepMind have announced a partnership to advance AI research. It'll basically enable DeepMind to develop a lot of virtual environments and tasks, uh, basically for doing a lot of AI research. Yeah, so the whole virtual environments, we had touched on that with him a little bit about how that's one of the values coming out of the AI space is seeing these virtual environments for being able to experiment in. So you should check this out and see what they're up to. Absolutely. Awesome. Melanie, why don't we go have a chat with your friends over in South Africa? Sounds good. I'm happy to have with us today Yabebo Fonte and Jessica Palafala. 
Thank you both for joining. Thank you for Thank having you. us. So, Yabiba, why don't we start with you? Can you tell us about who you are and your background? So, yeah, I'm Yababal Fantai, and I grew up in Ethiopia, Addis Ababa. And I did my undergraduate studies in Addis Ababa. And then I went to uh, Cape Town for my degrees, master's, and then I went to Italy for my PhD. And then did some postdocs in, in Europe and came back now to Africa with funding called the Robert Bosch Foundation. They funded this research chair called uh, Arete Ames Chair, which is really unusual funding because it allows you to work anywhere in Africa. And so I'm really enjoying being now pan-African practically, yeah. not just talking about it. So I am yeah, doing research in areas of cosmology, which is my main specialty, and also using satellite images to try to understand, you know, is Africa going in the right direction? And can we get that not only in the official statistics, but also through some uh, mining the data, which is available free satellite images. So that those are kind of background, I would say. That's great. And I know when we were talking before, you were telling me about some of the travels that you do for work, which is wonderful that you call yourself Pan-African. I think now I can call it like that. And it's really different when you are really doing it. It's actually much different because you really start seeing the similarities. And I think I'm now not just philosophically only, but practically it is, you know, Africa just as one makes sense. And that was probably the reason why people in the 1960s, you know, when they were talking about Pan-Africanism, they actually probably felt similar in a way. We share a lot more um, similarity than our differences. And our differences just within Ethiopia, we have so much difference within different uh, tribes than probably I have within other African countries. So in a way, you know, it's just natural that difference. It's our beauty and we, you know, we should just celebrate it. But at the same time, our similarities are a lot. So we just, we can capitalize on that. So. That's great. And then Jessica, can, ch- can you tell us a little bit about you? Okay, thank you, Melanie. Um, I was born in Bulukwani here in South Africa. And um, I, in terms of my studies, I did my undergraduate at Fitz University, and that was in economics and mathematics. I went on to do my postgrad to master's level at Fitz as well, and my specialization was in functional analysis, so I'm actually a pure mathematician. Oh, wow. Yeah, and so during my master's, I realized that I would like to use the skills that I attained to work towards a PhD that's a little bit more applied. And that's when I explored data science, and um, then I moved to the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, and now I'm doing my PhD in applied mathematics. And the area of my research is manifold learning and approximation theory. So it does allow me to use those functional analysis and harmonic analysis skills together with some new skills like information theory and coding. So it's been really a wonderful experience. That's great. And so the Africa Institute for Mathematical Science, um, I know both of you are there. Can you tell me a little bit more, tell us a little bit more about what the institution focuses on in terms of the research that it does? Yeah, it's like... so. African Institute of Mathematical Science usually just aims, uh, is founded in 2003 by Neil Truck. And I think the main idea was, of course, Neil Truck got those ideas by when he was traveling and he was inspired by how people think differently in, in Africa. And he believed that the way of thinking, the mathematical sciences should be the core. And that's where he, I think his vision was like, okay, let's have everywhere in Africa, not just, you know, in South Africa or localized, but just everywhere in Africa, let's have like these examples that could do in in any of the mathematics, physics or mathematics or economics, any of them, which involves some mathematical thinking to be, you know, leaders and to trying to be the first kind of um, an example for others to follow. So I think it worked. I mean, phenomenally and that's why we're still here and since even like it was in South Africa only uh, but then it expanded now to uh, six other countries in Africa and it's graduating I think that's more than 1,500 people wow. and from all over Africa according to the map that you see everywhere in Africa is green which means we have graduates from everywhere in Africa and that is really great. And then the research aspect came around 2007. Uh, it was started in, in South Africa, the AIM South Africa. So that one involved lots of researchers coming. Some of them just, um, they are temporarily. Some of them are uh, research scientists there, just but maybe affiliated to other universities, for example, Stellenbosch uh, and also University of Cape Town. So the kind of work we do, I would say like 
like there are financial mathematics researchers, there are biomathematics, and there is a cosmology, which I'm part of, but which also now evolves into the machine learning group. Right. And also now the data science group that Jessica is in. There are a lot more coming and going also, which I, I probably may not cover, but every of the mathematical science I would say is covered. Mm-hmm. And what makes AIMS special is that actually there are no lectures per se. It's not like it's a very different intensive one year, but a lot more introducing like, you know, people from everywhere in the world who are really doing amazing research. They come and teach there willingly, voluntarily, and they basically live with the students in the three weeks, three weeks module and they interact and basically just like the students learn not only the subject, but the way of thinking. Right. So which makes aims, I would say, very special. And yeah, and then AIMS evolved into the whole uh, Next Einstein Initiative, which is now centered in Rwanda and which is managing not only AIMS, but also there is like the Next Einstein Forum, which every two years brings together scientists, business people, uh, politicians in one. And this is the first of its kind. I mean, there was no such big gathering in Africa. And that's really what you see. I, I am a Next Einstein fellow and it highlights young people doing certain research. You know, and if they are excellent in their research, they bring them together and then they highlight, they give them that opportunity to expose through media and other. So AIMS and uh, the Next Einstein Initiative is doing really amazing. Yeah. Oh, please. Maybe, I don't know if you'd also like a student's perspective yes, as well. Yes, I would like a student's it's, it's, perspective. I would say the, the one thing that really stands out about AIMS is that it's research and learning intensive. I was at a university for seven years and the moment I stepped into AIMS, I can just feel the difference. It's a collaborative environment, like you said. You have researchers coming from across the world and it gives you an opportunity to network and interact with people who are like-minded, who have can maybe share ideas on the work that you're doing. And also it exposes you to people outside of the country that are working in your area and especially when you are exploring a new area like I am. Ames has given me the opportunity to do research visits in Berlin and visit a team that's working that has experts in this field so that I'm exposed to that and I'm able to bring back those skills. I think that's just the one thing that really stands out for me is that it's a collaborative environment. It's an intensive research intensive environment and um, I think that makes it different to the university setup. That's wonderful and you'd mentioned about Berlin. What other additional collaborations are done between Ames and other groups that you haven't already touched on like how does AIMS participate with other groups that are you know within Africa as well as outside again AIMS is not so it gives degrees but it's actually affiliated to uh, through Stellenbosch University so most of the students do projects in Stellenbosch University uh, University of Cape Town Wits other places so it's basically it is not like you know it's an academic institute but with wide open door for every collaboration with different universities within South Africa. And that is if AIM South Africa, if it's AIM Ghana, it would be like with all the other universities locally, as well as internationally, people would come. They have some research visits, grants that, you know, people come and just stay there for a month to do some kind of some of their research. And as Jessica was saying, to collaborate, then yeah. that's where you meet a lot of people, not only just the people from outside Africa, but also from inside Africa, they come to teach, they come to research visit. And so those through those facilitations to get those, those networks. So there's a lot of this networking being done within Africa as well as also uh, externally. Africa. And it's, yes. it's based on each person's, the work that they're doing and how that relates to other groups as well. What, what additional groups do you work with in terms of the research that you're doing? You'd be so doing? for example, like the cosmology group at Ames, they have collaboration with SKA, which is the square kilometer array. This is the biggest radio telescope being built. Yeah. And we have, we have the data science group there and the data science group and the cosmology group at Ames are collaborating. We work on different similar projects. And also every group has also their own collaboration that they bring together. For example, I have collaboration in Munich and have collaboration in Rome and Oslo, which I basically through that I bring uh, visitors and I also just uh, I go and visit. So it's the same, I think, as Jessica was saying, yeah. it's like there is a lot of this collaboration. Sharing of on. knowledge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. this is so. great. And Jessica, you mentioned you were at WITS. Uh, what is WITS? 
Okay, so the full name is the University of the Witwatersrand. It's in Johannesburg. Okay. And it's one of our oldest universities in South Africa and ranked the top in South Africa. Yeah. Yeah, I did my undergrad throughout to my master's. That's good to know. I mean, I know most universities do research. Do they have a very established research program as well? Affiliations with other groups as well? Because it sounds like there's work that's being done with AIMS yeah. between VITS. I've heard of it many times now. Yeah. Yes. So um, I think this is, uh, I don't know about in other fields, I think data science, I'm more informed because that's uh, yeah. where it's, you know, it directly affects me. We have a German research chair at Ames who's actually working with some of the supervisors at WITS and they are trying to also, you know, create a community of data scientists who can collaborate together. So one example of this is there's a full year course called the Theoretical Foundations of Data Science that was started by the former vice chancellor of WITS and Buba Kaba, who's at Ames. And what they're doing is taking staff members who have master's degrees and yeah. introducing them to data science so that they can explore it for their PhD. So just initiatives like that are taking place. So I do think that FITS is taking part in creating programs for data science and other research areas. Right, right. That's just one example. I'm sure there are many. Oh, I'm and sure. physics sector as well. They have mm-hmm. very strong particle physics uh, research group, string theory. Uh, they are very no- well known. So there are many of these research groups that are strong at WITS. Yeah. And it's very well established. I know another group that I've heard of talking a little bit about this is CSIR. Can you tell us a little bit about CSIR? That, that you know of? Yes. The, the only thing I know is that they are involved in many sectors of research. Yeah. So, in, for example, I know them through, the, they manage, as far as I know, that Center for High Performance Computing, which is based in Cape Town. This is going to be also the one machine that SK is going to be using because they have the experience as well as just the machines to do it. And my master's student have been, for example, using that just for his uh, all research. So they, they provide the high performance computing platform. And so they they are involved in many, many other research. For example, we got our satellite data from the the SANSA, which is the National Space Science Agency here. And they are also affiliated to CSIR in some way. In every branch I go, I actually see that. So it's like, yes, so it's it's kind of, I think, one of the main groups, you know, it it, it incorporates many research groups. It sounds like it's based in multiple locations, yes, similar to I think so, because there is one in Cape Town, I know. Yeah, um, and I'm Pretoria sure as well. What about some of the smaller affiliated groups that you work with? What are some of the examples of those that are, you know, they might not be located in multiple locations, but they do specific and very deep research. I know you've talked a little bit about some of them. Yeah, I mean, there are many uh, such initiatives. For example, I came out from the program called the National Astrophysics and Space Science, NASP, the National Astrophysics and Space Science Program. Yeah. And when I came to do my honors and master's through that program, it it has trained in the space science and astrophysics sector a lot. I would say like it has really influenced the landscape in Africa in terms of like graduate. Now you would find also graduates from many countries in that field. And that is a collaboration again between almost every university in South Africa. So it's like we, we were collaborating and like with Hermanus Observatory, the Observatory in Cape Town, Sutherland. So all this collaboration. But every university, for example, the Western Cape, they have very strong cosmology group. They are doing research. And they are one of the main science drivers now in terms of research, I would say, for the SK. They have lots of stuff doing in SK. And as I said, in WITS, UCT has many groups. Right. The cosmology group at UCT was the strongest till some time. I don't know now, but it's like they have the string theory, the cosmology, which was led by George Ellis, who was very you know prominent cosmologist who worked also with um, uh, other very prominent scientists in the field. So there are a lot. And I mean, the astronomy department, if you go, like they have researched, big research group. Even the, those that I'm aware that I have given a talk there or I have worked with people. It's, you know, it's, there are a lot of research groups. I, I want to touch on this. So we're recording this and I, I didn't start out the conversation with this point, but we are recording this at Deep Learning in Daba. I've been emphasizing that a lot when I talk about this on our podcast. We just were actually, before we recorded this at a session where we were listening to a couple of people talk about democratizing AI in Africa. One of the points that Nando Freitas made was that we need to have 
AI academic conferences, like in Africa, like AI academic conferences, a large one that's established here. And from everything you're telling me, there's, you know, significant amount of research. Now, we haven't touched specifically around the data science and the AI space, but there's significant amount of research that's going on. But what are your thoughts on his perspective? Um, I definitely agree with him. I have to agree with him, especially as someone who's just moved into data science. I see the importance of events like this. Research can sometimes be an isolating (laughs) thing to do and to take on. But when you are brought into a space like this one, you get an opportunity to really put your ideas out there and have people share their opinions and give you feedback. And I think feedback is really important, especially in a field that is still developing at the rate that data science and machine learning is developing. You really want to be in a space where you're producing work that's relevant. And you'll only know if your work is relevant if you interact with other people in that area. So this is really something I wish would take place, just not the deep learning in Daba. Um, I wish there would be more conferences of this nature. Yeah, it really, it's it's an opportunity to put your name out there as a researcher. It's an opportunity to interact with others. It's an opportunity to get feedback, to collaborate with others. And we need to be at a stage where we can collaborate across countries in Africa. And I think this is the best place to meet those people in other countries that are working on something similar to what you're working on. Yeah. I think it's, I mean, to add on that also, I think it's the most important aspect is that usually these are signs that people are taking it serious and people are, you know, paying attention. Government then will respond to it and policies will, you know. So this is just like a sign that also shows you like, okay, people have understood the significance and the bigger it is, it also tells you like, okay, people are active in the field, right? They're trying to, to work on that and creating that platform. Basically, I mean, I have seen lots of research that came out from Sudan and other places where there are no actually staff doing it, but the students are interested, right? So, and therefore they kind of like have this supervisor, but who's also probably not in the field, but they go and do it. The ones I observed. It's such a nice, amazing um, research, or the, the idea is nice. For example, one that, what that impressed me was this Sudanese girl. She was like, she showed me the statistics, like, okay, there is depression in the Arabic world. Many people die out of suicidal depression. From the mental health standpoint, yes. yeah. Yes, yeah. in Sudan. And so she thought like, oh, you know, why not? Can we help them? And then also, of course, she showed me also some of the um, statistics she got from the, I think the UN organization, where it shows young people who are depressed actually go to social media to say something about uh, their depression. And so her idea was like, oh, can we then discover that early on such that they can actually, you know, get help. And of course, the, the method she implied, she collected by hand, because she said in Sudan, many of the social medias are not working. So she collected by hand from Facebook, you know, she, she went to group, join the groups, right? And then just collected this uh, data by hand, labeled by hand. She got about 3000 from Twitter and stuff. Of course, there were some flaws, I mean, in her derivations, but that's it. The point is that she has got everything but there was no one probably to guide her through like all the, you know, the technical difficulties. And coming here into the deep learning in Daba and just me being there and at least saying like, okay, you know, this is an amazing thing, but you have like these sampling issues, these things, it just would give her like that insight, right? And then she can form collaborations. So all these things wouldn't have happened if you don't have such a, exactly, exposure and venues to present your work, however small it is, but putting your effort out so that people can then give you the age to just go over and, you know, be what you, you can be. And so I think this deep learning in Daba and similar there is also in Daba X, but it, it's really a great start and there should be more. And, you know, for me, what really, there was a depressing statistics recently that came out from McKinsey is that it's going to be this revolution, the AI revolution is going to be changing the GDP as more or less in the same level as the one which is the first industrial revolution, which we know the effect, right? It's like it just created a massive shift. But their simulation shows that actually Africa and other developing countries may not get the benefit because already the landscape has been so much shifted to um, mostly US and and China and other countries who are already strong. So you, you really need some kind of intervention 
to make you know this prediction wrong right because we want to be participating we want to benefit from it we want to change and and other like the wave studies for example the world economic forum they actually put the fourth industrial revolution to be maxima africa to be maximally benefiting from those so there are these predictions where like africa has all the challenges that can be addressed you know most of them can be addressed through systematization resource management and all that and at the same time here you have like the you know the economic the gdp thing so if you match them there is you know like if these platforms are becoming more and more i definitely think those simulations can be wrong what do you think could be done from a research institution standpoint to help this gdp issue the the fact that there is this <laughs> expectation that you're already behind the the times i guess i think what is important is for us to focus on african problems in terms of research and not try and produce research that is not related to solving african problems whether it be the drought in cape town etc that would keep our research relevant to the african climate and also allow the results of our research to benefit us and maybe that's when we will see the developments in ai also benefit our gdp and um, maybe as a country or as as african states another thing i think is research institutes need to do their very best to keep their students and not lose them to um universities in north america and the uk and um europe as the case has been for many years this causes us to fall behind in terms of research this also causes us to not have ownership of african research for me these are the kind of things that are just hindering the progress with respect to research in ai and machine learning holding on to researchers and also working on african problems I think an another aspect which uh, I would say say like for example another research that I was really greatly enjoyed in the post session was Jessica's who was who is working actually on the foundations of deep learning you know I believe that it's just not only you have to and you have to have you have to build the confidence not just only to do something but also to follow your curiosity right so i think what they are doing for example in this manifold learning trying to find a certain aspects such that they can then uh, improve the you know understand how the actual the, the black box foundations yes, of how the black box is working mm -hmm. and trying to then get the you know so competing at the global at the cutting edge mm -hmm. you know, that's also you need that kind of confidence and you need to build it right because without that confidence it's basically going to be like we're just going to be like happy to be sitting nearby you know somebody <laughs> right and i think that mentality and that's why i really like also new trucks way of thinking sometimes and why this, this there is the quantum leap africa institute which is we just started recently and the whole idea was like yeah like let's be bold because you know this world i think they they say it again and again it's only for those who really can dream big and just are not afraid and take to the risks. just go into take yeah. the risk. so in that is like in the quantum like we know okay right now it's still the the game is not decided you know and data science and and ai we have a lot to contribute so and but we also have to plan the future to lead for example some of the expected innovations or uh, revolutions that may be coming the quantum computing so the quantum leap africa is that okay let's gear our mind that we will be the leaders in that field mm -hmm. right now we have data science let's build because it requires the compute like the, the quantum machine we require algorithms we require like sensors and the stuff let's build to what we have now to that let's have all the expertise let's not be worrying about whether it's this or that it's like let's build our confidence let's have like that kind of ambition because mm -hmm. it's only the ambition and i think i i can share so many times that the people in west africa about when they play football it is that ambition that drives them that makes them you know play um in europe and the uh, people in kenya and in east africa in general when they run which is just also part of you know partly it influences me i just think about winning right it's like i, I just even don't think about that confidence was built by few people who broke just that kind of sphere where it was blocking and suddenly someone just got gold or they were just the best players and then people were like it was me it was just you know i can relate my life there was nothing special and so it's just you know you build that confidence and so like all these ambitious uh, projects as well as i'm also leading the community of scientists in africa which incorporates 
the Nextenstein fellows and Nextenstein ambassadors from all over Africa. And we are trying also exactly to, to do like, we are doing something. We are close to the research and the knowledge. And the politicians are very close to the decision they have to do every day. It's a hard job, right? The business people have to deal and they have to survive. So that dialogue we can form. I mean, because we have the time to think and we have the time to reflect. We are easy to the data. We can analyze and get uh, the insights. And then we have to share that one. So we have like in this policy advising. So we have objectives like to try to be like advising AU in some, because the, these fellows and ambassadors are working on every field from medical to climate to economics to, you know, computer science, I mean, data science. So it's everywhere. We have all those fields and we're increasing. We're not just like fellow and ambassador. It's all about let's build the community and let this community contribute in all forms. Just let it not be dormant. I mean, the, the whole point is that let us not be passive. And in this transformation, all the work, the fundamental work, the pure mathematician has a lot to contribute as well as, you know, the, the one who's doing at the, just basically in the clinical testing in some remote places. So there is a lot more to do. So uh, I think those would, I would say, contribute in making sure if we keep doing them in the right way, I think it will make the, these predictions wrong, I would say. And I, I noticed when I've been talking to people at the conference that there's a common fear that I don't know enough. I'm afraid to, to jump in, but yet I'm here because I'm interested. <laughs> and I'm bringing this up because I've talked to a lot of people who are in this space or who want to be in this space in many locations. I've been very lucky in that regard to be able to talk to so many people who are trying to get into AI from all over the world. And there's that, that common fear and common intimidation. It's everywhere and it's here. And I've heard people talking about this here as well. So you're talking about the confidence. I think the, the question becomes like how to encourage people who don't feel like they know. I think that's also the key too. They don't feel like they know enough and they're afraid. How to encourage them and, and what do you think could be done to help make sure that the barriers to entry don't feel as intimidating? Okay. Firstly, I think one of your first questions was, why do people feel intimidated by this area of study? And I think from what I've seen thus far is that machine learning or data science is a multidisciplinary area. And I think that's the intimidating part, that mathematics alone is not enough. You know, it's a combination of statistics, mathematics, and computer science. And that requires, if you're coming from any of those angles, you're going to be required to broaden your knowledge on the other topics. So I think that's the first thing. And uh, I don't think it's something that should be seen as a you know, barrier because the support is there, especially in universities, especially because this is an upcoming field. So supervisors, institutes are aware that people who are doing research in this area require a little bit more support in that regard. I think conferences such as this one do help provide you with that confidence, like Yababal was saying. Um, I'm working on a problem and being able to present to my peers and present to people who are more experienced in this field also allows me to gain more knowledge and allows them to also nudge me in the right direction, provide me with the resources that I need. So these kind of conferences are really, it's, it's really important to have these kind of engagements where when you present, someone might be a little bit more experienced in that field and you're stuck on something that for them is just a quick, hey, here's a resource. Once you've taken a look at this, it will push in the right direction. Or, hey, here's my email address. Let's meet up and we'll take this further. So I think that's that's a good starting point. I mean, there are many other things that can be done, but this for me is in the year that I've been studying, this has been one of those moments where I've learned so much in a period of four days. It hasn't even come to an end yet. <laughs> mm. I think that, that that really does get the job done. Just to add on that, I think it's, I think she said most of the things also I would have like to say in terms of this kind of platforms definitely put you in that context. Like the people there, you know, who are doing great out there and you, the differences are like not that big as you think. And so it just gives you the proof to yourself to check that you are in the right direction or is the things you miss or the things you thought it's big it's not big it kind of gives you the laboratory to check for yourself and usually those i believe are the only way that you will get confident right so another aspect that i'm working on that because that's for me the most important thing that happened to my life so i i relate directly to it is that because you know you you could be planning i mean i was ambitious 
you know, Abdullah the Killer for me was like, yeah, like, what did he do? The Abdullah the Killer is one of the runner in Ethiopia who got the first uh, Olympic gold medal in, in the 1960s. He was the first African to actually do that. And it inspired the generation of runners, you know, uh, from that on. And there were a couple of things he did, which I don't know how that relates, that fits. But for me, you know, I like the narratives because it really helps me. He was running barefoot and he was training in Ethiopia barefoot. And he went to Japan in the Tokyo Marathon. Then he was given a, a shoe to, to run to. And he was like, and he had to decide. I mean, that's my narration, you know, I like to put it. And he had to decide to run on this thing that he hasn't got used to. Everyone is doing it or just do his way the way he knows, right? And I think for me, the most spectacular event was he decided to just run barefoot, just his own way. And then, you know, he ran, just completely made history, right? So, so I think one thing I draw from that experience and the same can be said, I think in the Western uh, Africa for the football probably, is that people to achieve greatness, they didn't just have to pretend you know, they had to do their own way. Right. And they had to be taking the consequences, right? So for us, I took that inspiration for me. And then uh, we have this project, that, which is, I would say, a significant fraction of my three years. In the last three years, I spent thinking about it because that's what's important. It's like what, checking every detail in, in, in how you moved in this space. And what we do is that it's actually, it influenced whom you knew when you were a child. Like, did you know a mathematician? I mean, and if not... When you become a mathematician, you won't be confident, right? It's like because you feel like you may not understanding it the right way. If you didn't know a physicist, when you got into physics, you're not sure. But it just, it seems so naturally so nice is that even just one handshake when you were like probably four years old with a physicist could have changed that thing a lot. Because then that propagates in time. Like, yeah, like when you talk with your peers, you probably would say like, yeah, I know a mathematician, you know, they do this. It's like, it's like, but then you think, and every time you say those statements, you're actually thinking, right? So it just doesn't even need sometimes maybe a lot. It just needs people everywhere in remote areas. They need to see the real people doing, that's role modeling. Mm -hmm. So what's, what we are doing, uh, we have this project, which is really, you know, as I said, the significant part of my thinking in the last three years spent on that, is that we have Astro Bus Ethiopia. So what we do is that we take in the bus, we get all the people and we don't distinguish because abstraction and composition is like, you know, an idea, you abstract it and then you use those abstracts to compose. That is mathematics, that is physics, that is art, that is fashion design, that is painting, that is poem, that is everything. Like you get, you get to some abstract level, you use that abstract level to create some symphonies, right? It's just like music, notes to symphonies. And so we take that one, so we bring everyone, we don't, all those people who believed in it, but we're also doing things like real fashion designers, if it's scientists, scientists who really have that ambition and to do, inventors, so we have like art, science and innovation, we put together, we put in the bus and we just drive across the whole country and we just get off and we just, you know, what we do is mostly no teaching, it's not about teaching, it's about belongingness. You belong to me, I belong to you. We are in the same, you know, family. So when you know me and when you see me now in a TV, you will say, I know that guy. You know, I met him. Like, and that's that confidence. We, we take that in aspiration and we are doing it and we are trying to expand it also in other parts. We want it, for example, in Rwanda, I want the Rwandese to do it. In Senegal, I want the Senegalese to do it because that relation cuts that barrier, which is like, you may have a different opportunity. So, like, so in Ethiopia, we want to do it with Ethiopians. We're doing in IBM, we're doing in uh, Silicon Valley, we're doing a research in cosmology and fashion design. We want them to be there and just shake because then the kids don't have any more reasoning to say like they are different, they're right? They're not they capable. Are, exa yes. Yeah, because they well, are them. I so, love the uh, fact that there are many people here who've come to this conference who are very much junior, very much just entering the space, who are... Who, you know, have taken the risk, have have overcome their intimidation. And also I've seen so many people who welcomed them in and been very inclusive. And that's been really impressive. Before we wrap up, I just want to touch on a couple of things. Um, any other like things that you've seen that you were really excited about by this conference that you wanted to touch on that you wanted to mention? I think there are, as I say, I mentioned some of them. I really yes. was, even if Jessica is at Ames and we talked and I know her supervisor, 
it, it was very good to see what they are doing. Like, and so I went to her poster and I was like, I asked her, you know, to tell me in detail, like what's going on, you know? So it, it was really impressive to see, you know, that confidence of like really working on just the foundation of deep learning, especially this black box that, you know, we still don't understand trying to find and, and their method is different and clever and I, I'm you know I'm not qualified to say anything but it's really impressive that people are thinking and, and, and pushing in the boundary not only just in the application side but also just in the pure and uh, the pure math science and another aspect is just you know those people that is one example but I have seen other people doing really clever but more of like concerned from their own you know like what they think is a problem so then they're trying to use the methods like available and trying to improve life, right? So I think, yeah, those are those were the moments I was very much happy that I am here. And even if I'm not a, you know, a big believer of in this big, com big conference are like, we draw ourselves, right? And we just look and we meet. Networking is the biggest thing for me in these kind of things. And as I say, me talking to that person, the other person talking and just guiding here and there and the other person guiding me on the problems they have. And so yeah. these things are what I really value from big conferences. Not the content would change, you know. Yeah. So I think, yeah, those are the kind of moments that, that makes me feel like, yeah, like we need to do more. I think this has to be not just one in Daba. There should be more in such a way that uh, because, you know, for such a billion population and the huge size, one conference is not a justice. Not so definitely, yeah. as Ignando is saying, it's just it's really we need to increase and we, we have to bring also the global competitors such that they can see this talent, such that, you know, there is fair collaboration that people could do here, something like amazing that could be highlighted. I mean, not only just change the lives of people in Africa, but also the lives in, in, uh, in the world, because we have a lot of different insights and i think that's what also neil track believes is that if we really have the chance to really grow it's because we see problems differently yeah it's like that's our gift so you know we can compete with that thing that's our raw resource so thank think, you yeah, that's uh, thank you okay and jessica what about you um yeah maybe i can just say three things yes one of the first things is the coding lab sessions have been very useful. I think for those, like you said, who are new in the field, it gives you exposure to the different topics across from CNNs, RNNs to just deep feed forward models. It just gives you that exposure you need. So if you're still in the process of identifying your problem and developing your problem. Um, secondly, for those who are more established in the industry, I think it's also great for them to just see what um, students are getting up to and other researchers are getting up to. I think it's been a great time for students to also almost make new relationships. And um, I know a couple of people who actually found co-supervisors during the conference, which is great, and some who have identified potential supervisors. Yeah. So that's just wonderful. And then within the students as well, we are coming up with ideas of how to bring a small scale endeavors into the rural areas, going back to, uh, like I said, I was born in Bolokwane, and this is something of great interest and in, um, part of a foundation called Seho Salisedi, and we do this at a low scale. So something like this motivates us and gives us inspiration of how to change the current sort of method that we are using when we go back into community. In one week, this conference is able to achieve so much. So this is a time for us to also be inspired as students who want to give back to the community on what is the best way to do so, to learn from the best, how to run a, a lab session, because in the rural areas, there aren't a lot of lab laboratories. In fact, the rural areas that I've been to, students are not exposed to computers. So it teaches how to efficiently give back to the community. If this conference can do this in one week, it's inspiring us to go back into the community. It can take one week to also change students' lives and give them that representation that he was talking about. That's great. All right, last question for you both. In a couple of words, can you tell me if there's any key resources that you'd recommend based on you know what your experience has been and anything else that I might not have covered that you wanted to make sure you touched on before we wrap up? Jessica, why don't I start with you? Okay, so um, one thing that's been very useful for me is Coursera. If you are someone who's moving from pure mathematics or pure statistical background, I think Coursera is a great place to start because um, you really get to learn in your private space and uh, there are no limitations to your learning. 
I went through a number of courses, some are 11 weeks, you can really cut down that time if you're really focused. And they will give you exposure to like the machine learning course just gives you exposure to an array of different algorithms. So if you're new to the field, Coursera, go onto the website, explore the different options that are available, and it will just give you far more exposure than maybe a semester course would. So definitely that. And Yeah, and obviously just always go through papers in the field that most interests you. Um, That's a good starting point. That's always a good starting point. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, I would say I think those are great resources. And there are many online courses that are very, very, very good, like that people don't have excuse. Main issue could be language. And that's I think that's what's. Uh, this the Google AI in Ghana and others are trying to and IBM I know it's they are also working so they're trying to fill that gap between you know people who don't understand but another I think just if I mention one other resources like the Karpati page uh, which is very good in sometimes bringing some complicated concepts in a very easy way so I think those are I mean I think I would put those links there and uh, yeah those, those are, are great ones yeah. mm. and and last words of advice being take risks Yes, I think we need to go in the direction it hasn't been tried before. I like that. Yeah, Mm -hmm. because otherwise we know the ones didn't work. So try new directions. Try new directions. Thank you, both of you, very much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's also a pleasure having having us. (laughs) Thank you again, Yabibel and Jessica, for coming onto the podcast and sharing your insights around AI research that you're doing in the area and you know other groups and what's going on. So we appreciate you coming on the podcast. Yeah, thank you very much. Mark. Yes. If I'm using the cluster autoscaler for Kubernetes or GKE, mm-hmm. how can I prevent it from removing specific nodes from the cluster when scaling down? So um, cluster autoscaler for Kubernetes is something I've been digging into lately. It's actually a really cool technology in that what it does is that as you create more and more pods through essentially any mechanism, deployments or other such things, if it finds that there isn't enough room for those pods to exist, it will add nodes up into a, a specified limit that you add. So it'll be like, oh, you've you now got a thousand, so let's make sure there's room for that, and it'll add nodes in a timely manner. And vice versa, if you're like, oh, I only need now a hundred now where I had a thousand, it will sort of scale it back down again. All very cool. But there are some scenarios where you might want to be like, don't remove that node. Like right now, it's fairly arbitrary in terms of what it removes. It just makes sure that there's still room for things you need and things like that. It will kill like empty ones. But there is actually some control that the cluster autoscaler gives you as well. If there's particular nodes, maybe you're running a daemon set on or you have specific hardware on a particular thing, you want to make sure it doesn't get brought down. And there's a couple of interesting ways you can do this. And I think this is actually really cool. So at the node level, there is a annotation you can add. Basically, a scale down disabled is true. So if you add that, to a particular node, it's just going to go, nope, I'm not going to touch that one. It's fine. I don't care. But the other thing worth noting is sometimes you might not know what node you want to prevent being able to get rid of. What you actually may also want to be able to do is say, hey, if there's this particular pod running on a particular node, don't kill that node. And so you can actually do that too. I didn't realize this up until recently, and I thought this was really cool. If you add the annotation safe to evict false on the pod, whatever node that is on, the cluster autoscaler will not remove that, which is also cool too. There's a bunch of other restrictions as well too. We'll link to the fact in the show notes. It'll talk things about stuff about pod disruption budgets and a few other things. But I thought it was also just really nice that the cluster autoscaler gave you that kind of control, both at a node level and at a pod level, to be able to control what it does when it scales down. Because usually scaling down, that's the trickier problem. Nice. Yeah. Thanks for that insight. Okay, Mark, where are you going to be next week? Where am I going to be next week? Where are you going to be this month? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, This month, I may be at United LA. I still need to make a decision on that. I'll see what's happening there in October. But I know you said this month, but I'm really excited because I'm going to my first KubeCon in December. And I got uh, accepted as a speaker. So I'm really excited to see a whole bunch of people at KubeCon. Good. That's awesome. What are you up to? I am going to be speaking this week at Monktoberfest over in Maine. And then I will be at CAMLAS, which is a security data conference that's in Washington, D.C. the following week. Awesome. That's the plan. Fantastic. Well, Melanie, thank you so much for joining me for yet another podcast. Thank you, Mark. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you all next week. 